through that process of the materiality of this stuff, you would meet hundreds and hundreds of people, and the networks were basically built around the printed work. To paraphrase Cobbett there. However, I think nowadays we have a real problem because we now communicate almost solely online, usually in sort of like isolated algorithmic ghettos, and actually you can be as radical as you fucking want on Twitter, but you may never actually meet anybody in the real world who shares your content. So I would like us to return to print culture because I'm a bit of a grab. However, I'm going to sort of stop, stop talking now and break Yes, I guess um, I would hate What brings me here? Talk to Jay. Yeah. Talk to me. Hi. Hi, Aaron. So I'm talking to you because you're a student union person. So I yeah. always want to start with a union man. And um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask you um, how you think it's going currently. Are they listening to the student union in, say, the Labour Party, for instance, which you would expect to be representing? Um, <laughs> sorry, you might have to give me a second for that question. Okay. I'm sort of like, yeah, sorry, this might not be, this probably won't be usable, but um, I'm sort of like a bit removed out of doing like student politics or so like stuff with sort of whether I think the government is listening to the student movement is like, it's not, it's not really like something I'm super focused on. Um, but I, I'm, I just need a sec to collect thoughts. Um, no, I think, I think students are, are pathologically uh, ignored by governments. I think we've, we've seen Keir Starmer go back on promises to abolish tuition fees and we've seen promises consistently made to students throughout years. We've seen 13 years of austerity from a Tory government. We've seen tuition fees go up and up from, you know, it was only 25 years ago that you could go to university for free or not that much, not that much longer ago. And suddenly we have this like, this university system, this education system that's been naturalized to us that you will pay 9,000 pounds if you're a home student and you can pay, look to be paying twice or even more of that if you're from an international school student and like consistently students are telling us that the cost of living crisis is hitting us harder than anyone else and despite that we're seeing we're seeing year-on-year -year increases and you know like real-term cuts to our tuition fees consistently becoming a student every single day is is harder and harder and I think with this 2017 sorry to interrupt you yeah. um, they, in 2017 the Labour manifesto said that they were going to abolish tuition fees and help students again yeah um, it was part of their idea of how you manage to grow an economy. I mean, everyone else in Europe realizes that. Eh? Um, uh, but Keir Starmer has he agreed to that in 2017, didn't he? He did. He promised he would keep to the 2017 manifesto. What has he done? Well, he's backtracked on it, and I think we can look at it and we see that the sort of 2017 movement, when that was in the Labour manifesto under a, a Labour with Jeremy Corbyn as Jeremy Corbyn as its leader, was much more hopeful. We saw a lot of the reason why that government was so successful was off the back of organising off students. It was off student campaigning, student canvassing, door knocking, campus activism, and how the student movement stretched not only to, to for its campaigns on campus and its demands and what it was arguing for a transform education, but what the implications of that transformed, liberated, totally different education that students were arguing for, how that, how that was to influence society, how that was to change the economy, how that was to change the world. And I think we've seen a really hopeful movement sort of regress back down to Keir Starmer where we see these, these two governments, the Labour government, who's supposedly for the people, and Tories, and it's becoming harder and harder to tell the difference. That's right, okay. <laughs> I won't say <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to have any ideas on my own. <laughs> So how do students feel then now about um, the Labour Party? I think students feel um, <sighs> students feel dismissed, they feel ignored, pushed to the side. I think maybe we feel a bit like pawns that we've been offered this this sort of um, we've been promised this this removal of tuition fees and all of these promises about changes for education but instead we're seeing our humanities courses being slashed you know I'm, I'm a student at Sussex University the, and the neighboring campus Brighton University is seeing um, uh, 400 of its staff being threatened with redundancy and I think it's 16 out of 25 of the humanities department are facing redundancy so you know I know students who are, I've, students who are doing their dissertation and their supervisors um, are now suddenly unable to help them they've had to 
be changed to supervisors that aren't specialists and is what they're trying to write about and students being left without support, they've been financially, pastorally, you know, like academically, the whole system's crumbling and I think we're really seeing what the ends of this neoliberal higher education system, like what that results in. We're in, we're in the sort of late stage of it now and it's falling apart, like it's on its knees, it's not sustainable for the staff, for the students, it's not effective, it's not tenable. Have you ever seen the film um, O. Jeremy Corbyn, The Big Lie? I haven't seen it. It's a film that was made in order to show how how Jeremy Corbyn was was destroyed. Um, so the promises were made by one kind of Labour government mm. or Labour plan, yeah. and then cut off by another plan many decades later. Um, the the loss, the, the Labour Party, because it's really now can't say we, uh, the Labour Party <laughs> has lost. 300,000 members, many mm. of them still live. Yeah. Um, do you think they will ever, do you think they will vote Labour? Well, I'm one of the students that the Labour Party lost. Like I said, it was hopeful under Corbyn and I've seen Keir Starmer and seeing the regression. You know, we saw Rebecca Long Bailey being posed as this like, uh, at the time when it was the decision of who would become the next Labour leader. We, we saw Rebecca Long Bailey posed as this sort of, she doesn't know what she's talking about, she's too young, she doesn't have the experience. And we saw this, this man of Keir Starmer who was, you know, the, the director of public prosecutions and had all this experience. And yet, when we look at his history and what he'd actually done, it was, you know, it, he, he's the man who put Julian Assange in jail. Yeah, and he, this experience, you know, I think it was kind of it was kind of there for us all to see. Maybe we shouldn't be so surprised that, um, well, at least that, in my opinion, Keir Starmer is such a failure to to the Labour Party and its values, and, um, and I think the left movement in this country. Um, whether students vote for the party under Keir Starmer, I, I, I sincerely struggle to see how anyone, in, at least of this sort here. Um, could be interested in the politics of the Labour government, who is for the people, yet continually continue, makes decisions that are, you know, are difficult to discern from conservative politics. Thanks very much, Aaron. You're very good on camera. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a really good broadcasting voice. Thank you. And, and, you, and you've chosen the right university as well. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it, was, it, it played into the decision, it's uh, politics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Cheers. You get us off to a good start. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Talia. Talia. And, and Jane. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Hello, Talia. Hi. Um, I hear you're from CWU, the, yeah. the Postman's Union. That's right. Well, it's the Communication Workers Union. So yeah, it's. I know. I, yeah, of course. Yo, I know, I know. So I was just. <laughs> only because it's Posties, yeah. and then it's also, um, yeah, BT and Telecoms. Oh, right. And then also, yeah. now it's Tech Workers as well. So. Yeah, you know, you always have to tell anybody who's over 70 <laughs> to be told to every single time. You know? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to start talking about the Cold War. Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, so I'm, I'm here today to really just get into a bit more involved in like, zine making and a bit of community kind of, yeah, it, it, creating some material for campaigns we're running, maybe for our workplaces, and just get a bit of an idea of um, yeah. that sort of collective yeah. material making. Unions really. are getting a lot more active, aren't That's they? That's true, and yeah. Beginning to think again about how they should look to the world and present what they're, That's exactly what, right. what they're doing. I mean, I, I bake for the union um, uh, benefits, that's mm -hmm. all I do, you know. They also serve who only stand and bake, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, but, I'm, uh, but I am very interested in visual images yeah. and, and social change. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind
kind of what kind of image of the CW do you think? And the, and the not just the CW but the spike. Yes. What kind of image do you need to make? Yeah. Well, so, so this this is so. Uh, um, for me, so I'm part of the National Tech Workers branch, um, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it's interesting for us because in general, our branch is predominantly very young people working in tech. Um, so it, we're, we've coming up, we're coming up against this quite a lot in that um, appealing to young people and where the unions are starting to grow, um, we're actually starting to recruit and starting to grow our movement in tech as a completely greenfield um, environment. There's no unions there at all, really. So being able to appeal to young people and being able to show that the unions can be a modern establishment, can be modern uh, forces, is really important. And so kind of tapping into that, um, that sensibility and that progress and that modernity and there's things like um, queer symbolism and symbolism for um, like anti-racism and trying to move away from this concept of um, unions as um, kind of static yeah. and yeah. Uh, th something of the past. Used to be supported by the Labour Party. Are the Labour Party supporting your innovations? Uh, not, uh, not, not a lot. Uh, we don't have a lot of contact with, uh, at least our branch, we don't have a lot of contact with the Labour Party. And what did you think of Keir Starmer telling his cabinet people not to go on your picket line? I didn't like that at all uh, myself. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. That was the day I started going on the picket line. Uh huh. Good. Glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Yeah. Wow. So I'm also a, a, um, I also should check with my, my committee member around our <laughs> interactions right. with, with like press as well, because I'm on a committee, so oh, I need to be careful. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. so yeah, 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 yeah. You do what you want. Uh, uh, you do what you want. Okay. Right. So, so are you on picket line? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, so um, we're not striking ourselves in um, our branch because we don't, we're not recognized in any workplaces yet. Um, or we have recognition in a couple workplaces. But we show a lot of support to the rest of the union. So we also show up to the postal workers' strikes and also strikes in other workers as well. Uh, picket lines with the unions. Yes, there are, we, we, get, we get some. Yeah, that's quite often, it, especially if it's local politicians and like the councillors. It, yeah, that it, 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 it does happen. You do get some, yeah, and they often get told off. <laughs> Cabinet members? Oh, yeah, sometimes, but... Have you ever seen Keir Starmer on your picket? I personally have not, no, but... <laughs> right, okay. So, do you, do you think that... Um, do you think Keir Starmer, if he gets into government, do you think he'll... Do you think if there's a, a Labour government next under Keir Starmer, that things will change for you? Um, personally, I would like to say that I hope so, but I'm not that optimistic, unfortunately. Um, so I'm also trans as well, and Keir Starmer has not been very good on those issues. So firstly, I'm pretty um, disenfranchised from the leadership of the Labour Party at the moment. Thank you, thank you. I really like your dress. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's like, um, what do you call it? Oh, of course. Um, so, uh, I just sort of uh, found myself in this um, zine making group. Uh, I, I didn't know what was going to be happening here before I came. So you but just want to learn to make zines. 
Yeah. yeah it's um, nice. It's a nice way to start the day. I think so. I think. Um, yeah. What brings you to the World Class Forum? So my partner is uh, speaking at a panel um, today and tomorrow. Uh, so I'm invested in trans liberation politics and also climate change politics, um, but really all of all of the prob like issues that we're facing require solidarity between them. Like there's there's not distinctions between like immigration, refugee issues and, and, and trans issues and women's issues and, and workers' issues, all these issues are related. Yeah, and human rights, don't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> even, even, even the um, climate issues come under human rights as well. I know. Um, Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, you know, they're really like umbrella people. Not everything under their umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, the Labour Party conference is starting here tomorrow night. Expect on all of those issues that you, you described from the Labour Party's conference. Uh, will go forward or very little for insults, honestly. Uh, I find the Labour, the current Labour and um, opposition approach to uh, everything I care about <laughs> quite demeaning and insulting. Um, so my girlfriend's going to be speaking at a panel about trans liberation. The Labour Party has uh, consistently the Labour Party's been uh, maintaining. Okay, so the Labour Party conference starts on really on Sunday, uh, and you described the major issues. Um, are you expecting? What are you expecting from the Labour Party uh, conference? Will there be any, any progress? Uh, I'm expecting very very little to be excited about from the Labour Party conference. Um, they've consistently been uh, abusing and expelling socialist members from the Labour Party. Um, I, so my, my partner's here to speak about trans liberation at TWT. The Labour Party has been abusing and, uh, and demeaning uh, trans people and queer people in the in the party has been hosting for example Rosie Duffield who uh, is a violent transphobe and has been attending hate conferences again like targeting trans people where people have stood up and said if trans people are able to walk around like unharassed in public that's that's a failure uh, so this is this is these are places where Labour MPs are going. There, there, you know, there's there's. Uh, I I live in South London. Um, there's been fascist demonstrations where people have been like l literal neo Nazis have been showing up to attack trans people. There's a direct pipeline between these people, uh, the sort of gender critical movement attacking trans women. And Labour MPs, Labour MPs, they're, they're, they're fraternising in the same spaces. And that sounds pretty dangerous. It's dangerous and scary. What do you think Keir Starmer's attitude to that is? Uh, that, he doesn't, that he doesn't want anything to do with it, that he doesn't know enough about it to intervene, and that he, he thinks it's a toxic subject to touch, but every time he touches it, he speaks in favour of the people who want trans people to not exist in society. Every time he approaches it, he lends credibility and legitimacy to the people that are trying to so not the hero of yours, then. Hurt, <laughs> hurt my family and my friends. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think things would have been different if you were not the head of the party? If what, sorry? If, if Keir was not the head of the party, do you think things would be different? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that 
the Labour Party is by any means like always progressive, always right on these issues, but before Starmer took over the party, uh, there was an investment in understanding queer people and the issues that uh, people are facing rather than seeing them as a liability to be abused and discarded, I think. Um, Do you think Jeremy Corbyn would have treated people the same way, are you, if, uh, if his party, if he had remained leader of the opposition? I, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm speaking too much about trans politics as a, as a no, cis okay. woman Don't here. Worry. As a that, whole then, as a whole, yeah. the, the whole issue of um, human rights. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I... Uh, Do you want to know what Pierre was before he was a politician? You know, was he was the head of the Crown Prosecution Service, right? So, f fundamentally, in my opinion, a class enemy. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't want the top cop in charge of the country. The same police that come out and abuse and harass queer people and facilitate neo-Nazis to roam our streets and wave around banners of trans women that they've beaten and attacked at previous rallies. They, they cr the, the police step in and create space for fascists in our neighborhood. Um, those same police that uh, facilitate deporting our neighbours and abuse us and beat us when we protest over climate change, over workers' rights, over anything. They'll be working for the Labour government, they'll be working for Keir Starmer uh, if Keir Starmer is in government. So That's I don't trust or respect him <laughs> at all. <laughs> very nervous, Thank but I hope there's something interesting. <laughs> Nice to meet you at the World Transformed. Um, so you're here in a, um, a seminar in the, um, which is about making uh, publicity images for uh, social change. Um, what's the social change that you're most interested in? Uh, I'd say I'm an environmentalist at heart, and um, I think we really need progress on movement in climate. Um, I think it's important to facilitate that change from a number of different campaigning mediums and making like creative campaigning or activism uh, tools or creative platforms is really important to get people thinking and thoughts being provoked and get them to start asking these questions in their own minds of say what the climate emergency means to them sort of building that relatability 
Um, my cause that I believe in is I campaign actively for a Green New Deal. Um, I represent it like I am an activist that does, um, call, I'm an activist for Green New Deal Rising and we work to try and influence like political oh, parties. Yeah. Um, organization. Uh, so it's Fatima Ibrahim and Hannah Martin who are the right. co-founders. Right. But uh, yeah, so I get involved, I've been involved this summer in sit-outs outside actually core right. Labour right. MP offices. Um, we've, we've been a bit quite dis disappointed how Kiss Starmer and Rachel Reeves have had quite a few promising climate commitments. There's like a £28 billion climate prosperity fund, um, which over the course of the year, I think politically they've thrown back on them to not too much pressure. Um, and we believe that like Labour has a responsibility to young people to give us hope for like a more livable future. So yeah, I've in Sheffield have been helping to organise sit-outs outside MP Louise Haig's office um, and just trying to push the action along. But uh, I really like, I really enjoy sort of the use of creativity. You might have seen Darren Cullen's bus outside um, and I've been really interested in like the idea of subvertising. Um, like I think we don't have much control of our public realm and what is advertised or represented within it. A lot of the adverts you'll see are for junk food, are for cars, are for fossil fuels. And one of the things I've learned recently is these adverts are most prevalent in areas of high social de deprivation, which is pretty sadistic, really. It's quite sinister. Um, so I really, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the Labour Party conference is starting on Sunday. Um, do you expect any progress on, on this at the Labour Party? Conference? Do I? Um, I don't. I would say. My personal view is it feels the Labour PR machine has very much, they've been most, like they've been thinking too much about what the opposition are doing and trying to follow in the wake of Sunak's Conservative government to appeal to one particular type of voter and become very complacent of the votes from the centre and the left who are desperate to see a change of government after 13 years of Tory austerity. And I'm really afraid the Sunak's comments, the rose back on net zero, the horrible plan for the motorists that he's brought out um, alongside a plethora of transphobic horror shows that we've seen in the Tory party government conference. I'm more worried about Starmer's Labour Party following in that wake and obviously they're not going to present themselves on that extreme far-right political um, if it, if it sit in that space but I'm worried that they're going to just do, be too busy trying to chase those votes and not really present any real alternative or meaningful alternative to what we have in government at the moment um, which yeah which you'd expect in the TWs. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a political strategist or scientist, okay. but I would say like, it seems like the space that they occupy now is very different from the manifesto Keir Starmer ran on when he was elected as Labour leader after Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, I think what's used is political realities um, of which respecting the economic state of the UK what good is an opposition which is refusing to oppose projects such as Rosebank, such as, like, I think Starmer described Rosebank or as, we will not reverse this decision because we've got to consider a baseline or an inherited state we get from the Conservative Party. That's not really good enough, isn't it, really? And I think, uh, respecting financial realities, like, if you're going to sort of high if you're going to make policy prejudices and, and then draw back on them based uh, to do with financial pragmatism fis fiscal responsibility i think it's a load of crap to be honest but uh, well done let's end on that yeah <laughs> oh, well done. yeah thank you very much. oh no no worries thank you and thank you for wearing such a good shirt oh thank you <laughs> i appreciate that no no it's just good fun.
Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's a bit bumbly. I'm not going to be. Oh, you're not at all. Oh, no, no. you're very good, and you have a good broadcasting voice. Oh, but thank you. Have you ever thought of radio? <laughs> I am seeking jobs at the moment. I used to work. I used to work for Cycling UK, and it was actually my last day yesterday. My temporary contract expired, so I am seeking work. If you've got any vacancies, I yeah. Open. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay. No. Well, thank you very much. And I, I think, are we done Let's here, and we can go to the um, hospital? We've met before. Yeah, yeah. I'm just double checking it's you because I've come off Facebook. All right. It's gorgeous and I'm sleeping. Just saying that these, these are the leaflets we've got that we're going to hand out to everybody okay. at the conference. Let's have a little. Very good. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Because they're, they're going to whip them out that of our hands. Really think. Gorgeous. Sorry. Can you just. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Good luck with your uh, process. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know Alma. Good luck with your process. Yeah. All right. You know Alma? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She wants, she wants to tell us about it. Your leaflet's brilliant. Do you want to, to explain it to us? Yeah, uh, um, well, we're Charlie, we're Charlie uh, and Scythe Ribble Hospital campaign. Uh, they're getting rid of all the expensive services, and in our case, it was an A&E. Here in Liverpool, it's maternity services. They're just not profitable enough for people to, to take on in the private sector. So this is what we're fighting, the privatisation of our NHS. Um, so we're here to tell Labour that we want it renationalised, full stop. There is no ifs or buts here. It is renationalised, back to Bevan model, where everything is free for everybody. We don't think that they're going to... Uh, we're not expecting much from the current Labour Party. We've already got... Uh, we all know all the Tory donors you've got here who've taken donations from private health companies. 
You know, we know they're corrupt. We know they're out of the way. We've always relied on Labour to be our voice. But as we can see, they're taking just as much money from private health companies. They are saying that the only thing that's going to save um, our NHS is the private sector, which is, excuse me for the camera, complete bollocks. It's the most expensive way to provide the worst service going. We know this from the, from the United States. You know, people, people die because they can't access health care. Uh, access healthcare. Um, so we want them to, to stop this nonsense, get rid of this, this neoliberal, let's make profit before looking after people. Get rid of it. We're demanding now that they renationalise the NHS. Do it again, please. Hold on, hold on. And again. Sorry. Give it a little bit lower. Sorry. Laurel and Hardy. Can I do it again? That's good. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks very much, Thank Jenny. you. Yeah. You seem to always get a bit fiddly at the end, you know. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to walk it down there. Can you, if you want me to hold on here to all the equipment yeah. while you do? Yeah. Is the... Yeah, it's off on that one, right. isn't it? We, we sort of ask for it, don't we? We dress in bright yellow and... You've obviously done it before, I think so. Um, yeah. Well, it was, it, you get, you're nervous at first. I mean, it was 2016 when they shot our A&E. Yeah. So we've been doing it quite a while. We're outside our hospital every Saturday morning for, for an hour. Um, they were there this morning. There were still 11 people, even though we're up here. Um, you know, which isn't a huge amount, but it's hard to keep it going for seven years with active people. And uh, yeah. well, the <coughs> well it, it was 391 weeks this morning that we've been outside that hospital. Um, and we go to all the ICB meetings and, you know, demands that they listen to us and we're trying to, we're trying to have a look at dental care because they're having, right across all ICBs, they're having another look at it. But they're basically saying at the moment, which is what we are holding them down to because it's, Dental, dental work's a brilliant example for what they're doing to the rest of it. Yes, exactly. But yes. before, it's not yet all in that, that yes. position that dental care is in. So that's why we're focusing on it, because they're doing it. But it used to be at NHS England that yeah. they now handed that back down to your ICB boards. So, Can it's you up drop 42. To Hill? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 These so, aren't often on the programme that we're making this just, just take it if you want. I don't need to be on the. <laughs> Waiting for me for. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just it's a good example to say. So basically, you're okay with just not providing the service. Yeah, 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 exactly. You're that's saying it. that that the only way that's forward. The end of it. So yeah. you're saying now that all the services that you're cutting back and you uh, that uh, that people do need to hello, Hi. people do need to go to private healthcare. You're saying that now, aren't you? Yeah. So that's that's where we are with the ICB board. But yeah. like I say. Dental care. They've stuck um, a telephone number. It's my job next week because I've not had time. No, I know you get um, well, well, it was the Tory party conference that we marched at last week right, because because yeah. we, we still need to hold them to account as well. Um, yeah, I know. And I, I'm just, you know, I'm lucky now. I'm retired. I can do yeah. more work. <laughs> well, there's there's a lady in um, Greater Manchester. She's like Bolton area. Hello. Um, Oh, that's a pretty dress. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. I do like that dress. Right, 
Yeah, and she's, she's just retired, Karen Reisman, her name is, she's unison. She actually got arrested during lockdown because as they were clearing away, she said they didn't clear away quick enough after they were told that they couldn't have a very, very socially distanced demo when it was only half opened up, you see, so... And they tried to say that she was... Uh, they, they tried she was to... breaking the lockdown rules, not like Boris Johnson. <laughs> yeah. they, they, crowd, they crowdfunded it and paid it, but she did get it annulled. But you have to pay it before they put yeah. you in prison. And uh, fortunately, it was crowd, crowdfunded. Yeah to do that, you know, we are a good lot when it comes to something like that. Well, I know, I mean, there are all sorts she's, of things that are being crowdfunded. And was, I, was I, she, well, it's, that's frightening as well. Yeah. And you see, you see, well, you see healthcare already being crowdfunded I know, healthcare, in this country. Yeah, of course, yeah. It's frightening. I mean, yeah, and the lady who went by with the food poverty thing on, I mean, yeah. your friend who you were talking to, I mean, that's another thing. The next week we've got a, mm. two weeks time we're filming at them. Hopefully there's going to be a big meeting of all the food bank people in London, yeah. um, you know, because it's, the problem with the food banks is that it's no. replacing justice with charity. I know, you know and exactly. That, uh, that just, and this is exactly Well, what that's what we're getting in the ICBs. It's, yeah. it's all the voluntary sector now. Yeah. And yeah, I keep and saying it, it is not sustainable. No, it's, it's not sustainable. Um, people shouldn't be begging for healthcare or food or housing and, oh. Um, my, my local Labour label CLP, um, very right wing. Strangely enough, they don't like me very much. Um, I, I deliberately stand as a Tusk candidate now just to yeah, highlight. Yeah, I like I'll never get Williams. in. I really like I'll him, never yeah. get in. Oh, I don't care. Stand as a oh, oh, we have. We already have three. In the local ca uh, elections. Brilliant. Oh, I must tell Chris that for when he introduces you. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand as a Tusk yeah. candidate in Chorley. Oh, great. Um, What's your surname, Jenny? Hurley. Jenny Curley. Yeah. I'll remember it, Jenny Curley. Yeah. <laughs> they all know me here anyway. You can just okay, ask them. Yeah, I can ask our Audrey who we are. Sure. Yeah, they'll all know. Um, oh, I've still got his thingy on. I better go and give it him back. Oh, heck, I just thought, what's that wire there then? It's an o'clock, isn't it? He walks away and just leaves me, you know. <laughs> I'm getting so many microphones that, no, that's not sure, uh. though. I'd better go and, uh, go and get the bed and things, haven't we? Yeah. I don't, I've got some help bringing no, stuff I hope down. he doesn't think I'm going to tell. I mean, I'm 73 years old. If he thinks I'm carting his equipment down to him. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Jenny. I'm sorry, we're making it an unaccessible, accessible entrance, aren't we? I'm sorry. <laughs> Chris, I don't know if JT carry it all. Yeah, I was afraid I, I, I was afraid I would drop something. So, um, Hello, um, hi. So, I don't know how you stand still with all this current. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us all about what's going on today? Well, we're here because the um, people who run the Liverpool Women's Hospital, the um, have decided that this is going to close and they're going to build a much, you know, another new unit right next to or on the site of the Royal Liverpool Hospital. But we know that this is a dual health and it's not just about uh, women who are having babies, it's about women who are suffering with gynaecological problems and all those other things that women. So it's about women's health and to close this is an absolute, I think it's 
There will be, there will be, I would have to say, and I, yeah, I don't mind saying this, women and babies are gonna die if this place closes because the reality is there are gonna be fewer beds in the new units. And the services, as we know, it provides, it's already got a high bed, bed unit here, bed capacity, and that is gonna continue. Um, Absolutely. Um, is going up. Absolutely. I mean, people think, you know, still think childbirth is a pretty easy thing. No, it isn't. There is always a risk. And all this about, you know, well, we'll take things out into the community. I'm afraid that when you're in a crisis or you want extra help, you want to be with people who know what they're doing. You're not going to be waiting on an ambulance. And we all know that people are waiting on ambulances to their death sometimes. So for me, it's imperative that we keep this open. We need a women's hospital in this city. And for them to talk about it, and my own theory is what I think they will do this. If they go ahead and close it, it will remain dormant for 12 or 18 months. And then we will have something catastrophic and then the care board will then say oh well we need to reopen we need more beds what about reopening and all you'll have in the meantime is private providers waiting in the wings come to take this over and that's what's going to happen and I am will fight to my last living breath to keep this under the National Health Service because I won't let it become a national ill health service so we've got to fight so it's this this women's hospital isn't just about maternity services it's more than that it's about women's health and it's about keeping women healthy in this city we already suffer in this area is probably one of the most deprived areas in the whole of Merseyside and we need to keep that going so I'm passionate about that and there will be if this goes ahead and I have to say to the people in charge people are gonna die women and babies will die and women will get later referrals into this hospital for any for any suspected cancers and we already know that that's on the rise that people are having to waste and it will continue to waste Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to fill out my stock on the thing. Yeah. Where would you put it? I just hold it up. Put it on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do it. Yeah. And then you can, and then you can. Well, you need just somebody else to hold it with you. No, I can hold it myself. You can hold the whole thing. I think I yeah, can. Yeah, sure. And uh, maybe you can just take a shot with my phone yeah. instead of it. Well, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. 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 Hi everyone, can I just say thank you very much for coming along on this wonderful day. My name's Teresa and I'm an activist and campaigner for Save Liverpool Women's Hospital. Yay! It's unfortunate that it's been eight years and we're still here having to do another march. It's our third one. Um, when we found out that the hospital was going to be moved, we knew that we had to show up because women bring every human being into the world, every single one. Um, I also campaign for Keep Our NHS Public. Anywhere where there's injustice, you should show up. And if you can't show up, sign a petition or give a leaflet out to somebody. Now, we're marching today for two things. To keep Liverpool Women's Hospital on site. We don't want any mergers. No move to the Royal because it will be lost in translation along with a lot of services. No closure, no cuts, and no taking services out of the back door to privatise them. And we also need to improve maternity care. The second one is to march for the NHS in its entirety. Because if we don't and the NHS goes, if you can't in afford insurance, people will die. That's a fact, just like in America. We need to restore, repair, and renationalise the NHS and stop all privatisation. And we need to support NHS. Thanks. And we need to support the wonderful NHS staff 
in their pain conditions because they're the ones that save lives, not politicians. <laughs> now we're going to have some speakers before and after the march. Listen to the stewards when we are market marching because we want to keep everyone safe. We don't want anybody to end up needing to use the NHS. The stewards will help you to cross the road safely and we've also got a first aider which somebody will signpost you to. We're going to march through towards the Blackie down by Chinatown by the Arch, along to the bombed out church, along Renshaw Street into Church Street to the Arch at the Albert Dock and there'll be more speakers at the end. And before we put our first speaker on... I'm so pleased to meet you and here we are at the World Transform yeah. and we've just been listening to James Smith and you asked him a very important question uh, that was all about um, your future and mine but I've not got so much as you <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the, the state of the world and, and the global warming and everything that's going wrong. One of the things that really shocked me was when you said that your friends are deciding not to have families. Yeah. Can you tell me something about that? Um, so, a lot of my friends have not decided have decided not to have children, unfortunately, because I'm 19, my um, friend's 19, 20s, that's the age that me and my friends are in. And by the time we have children in our 30s, mid 30s, um, the climate crisis will get a lot, lot worse. Um, we've already seen it this year the floods in New York, there's been floods all over the world, the heat wave we had in 2022. I think it got to 38 degrees in Liverpool. That is absolutely shocking. Um, and we think, why would we want to bring a child into this world where there might not be enough food on the table, there won't be fresh water, and there won't be clean air? So it's really political, and you, you see it as something which has really evolved. Uh, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And, and um, what do you think? Is there, is there any book you think that progress might be well, made? Um, well, after what Jamie said, I do feel a lot more hopeful. He said that the future isn't written and we need to be more hopeful. Because um, before I came here, I was very doom and gloom. I was thinking, oh God, I can't have children. I've got to stop eating meat. I can't go on holiday anymore. I can't go on a plane. And now I'm a little bit more hopeful because of events like this, um, <laughs> climate, um, so climate summits and climate policies. I do feel like there is hope. However, Keir Starmer and the Labour Party really need to stop with all the messing about. And they, I think they abandoned their climate um, policy um, earlier on in the year, which was one of the only policies which was really setting them apart from the Conservative Party. I'm not talking about the numbers, but it was a certain billion um, going towards climate policies each year. So that's what the government needs to say. So you feel that you've been let down by Keir Starmer? Oh yeah, definitely. I've really been let down by Keir Starmer. Um, <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn was the hope for the future. He was hopeful for a lot of my friends. And whatever you thought about his policies, you can clearly say that he influenced a lot of people. I joined the Labour Party at 14 in the 2019 general election. I left um, when I was 18 last year because Keir Starmer, it's the lies and just no hope whatsoever. So you've left the party now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, so, so in fact, in fact, the Labour Party's been a disappointment. Definitely, yes. They're having a conference this weekend here in Liverpool. Yeah. Do you think they'll make any progress towards things that might protect your future? Um, I don't think so. I heard Angela Rayner at the um, Trade Union Congress a few weeks ago set out policies supporting trade unions. But apart from that, I really don't see that much of a difference now. So, so in fact, what you need is reassurance from everyone else around you. I mean, we all need to reassure each other that we're on the same page. Yeah. Yes, definitely. But what can we do? What do you think is, what is the most important thing that you think that we can do? Um, Fund the NHS definitely and have concrete climate policies, which is law, which you cannot break these laws. Um, remember, we had List Trust last year going on about wind farms and how they were an eyesore. That was ridiculous. 
Um, I think we need just concrete policies which have to be abided by law and we need to lead the world. We've led the world before in the Industrial Revolution. We've led, the, Britain has left, not left, led the world. Um, so that's what we need to do. Um, it was just his message of hope really and his message of you can take on the state, you can take on Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak and you can be still be a socialist and supporting the Labour Party, maybe even voting for your Labour MP but have a look at other candidates, have a look for independent wow. socialists and, <laughs> and see how they fit against your own <laughs> Labour <laughs> candidates. You're studying politics at Liverpool and you're very <laughs> oh no, I don't think so. I haven't even thought about anything like that. Um, cause You're not my... going to run for office? Oh no, I don't think so. Why not? Oh well, a lot of them are liars and I don't really like to lie, so... <laughs> oh, that's a long way in the future, we're only 19, so I've not even thought about any of that yet. Okay, well thank you very much for oh, joining us, I'm really pleased to meet you. Oh, I'm really pleased to meet you too. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you can just take that off. Yeah.